Hello there. It's Most Things Kenobi. This is the podcast you're looking for. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Most Things Kenobi, a podcast about Obi-Wan Kenobi and all things Star Wars. I'm your host, Leanne. And I'm your host, Lauren. And we're back from our one week off, which was <laughs> the first week we ever took off in the past two f***ing years. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Out of necessity, oh, really. I crashed hard. I crashed hard on this week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's been a lot. I've been traveling. You have a lot going on in your house with renovations. And honestly... Yeah. How do you even follow up an interview like that with James Arnold Taylor? You don't. You just take a pause, re- regroup, and come back. <laughs> yes. So we're back. <laughs> oh, man, was that cool, though. That This last episode that we did with James was probably one of our best. I, I'm very proud of that episode. And yes. It was a good interview. I think it was fun, at least. I hope our listeners, most of the feedback we've gotten has been very positive. So, Oh, very positive. Not only that, but James, being the kind-hearted soul that he is, he didn't even have to do this, but he shouted us out, you and I, on his podcast recently. So that's, he said thank you to us. Yeah, which I did not wild. expect it. Yeah, <laughs> it was very kind. So once again, thanks, James. Thank you. And we'll just keep this circle of thank yous going until... <laughs> the end of time (laughs) so this week we are diving into something controversial which i can't even believe this is controversial honestly i don't get it me neither me neither me neither we're gonna chat about gray jedi and hopefully not anger the internet (laughs) well let me ask you a question yes do you believe in the gray jedi Yes, I do. Under certain circumstances, because there's two definitions of Grey Jedi, so yes. Right. And I believe uh, in it, too. And guess yeah. what? I Brace yourselves, okay? We're still Star Wars fans. <laughs> yes, and yeah, all of you out there, all of you out there who don't believe in the Grey Jedi, you're still Star Wars fans. Yes. What an excellent point. Mind blown. <laughs> what an idea. People what a can have concept. differing opinions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it is interesting. It's very interesting. And it's more than I realized because I did do some research for it. It's way more complicated. And there's more specific definitions than I realized were out there. So it was yes. very interesting to research it. I learned a lot. Do we begin by reading what the Gray Jedi Code is? Because, you know... The Sith and the Jedi have their codes, as we know, and it turns out that the Grey Jedi also have a bit of a code. Yes, if you have one you want to read, what I found is that there are multiple. There are. There are. But the one I like the most, (laughs) the one that makes the most sense given what I know about the Grey Jedi is this. Mm -hmm. There is no light without the dark. Through passion, I gain focus. Through knowledge, I gain power. Through serenity, I gain strength. Through victory, I gain harmony. There is only the Force. Mm-hmm. I like that because there's some kind of balance. It's the yin and the yang. You can't have darkness without light. You know, you can't appreciate yeah. good things without knowing the bad things, you know? Yes, for sure. And I think people argue that it's it's totally in opposition to what George Lucas was arguing about the force which i don't think is actually true if you've seen the mortis arc i don't think true. it's true true but i think what it is showing is that and i think this was his point a little bit is extremism or yes. fundamentalism in either direction isn't good because I someone played a clip of him talking to his room of writers using it as an example of why gray doesn't work and in my opinion it was explaining why being right down the middle is what you want you don't want to be a Sith Mm -hmm. and like Jedi are selfless but if you're too selfless you lose your sense of self and your humanity Mm -hmm. so it's like finding that middle ground and I don't think 
Well, let's start with, how about we explain what the two definitions of Grey Jedi are? That would be a great place to start, because if anyone is unfamiliar, there's a whole thing behind what a Grey Jedi is. Yes. There's two specific definitions, and one is a, a Force user who uses both the light side and the dark. So a lot of times it's a, a Jedi who turns away from the the Jedi code, so to speak, and will allow themselves to use the dark side and explore all facets of the Force. Mm -hmm. Then there's the definition of a gray Jedi who kind of turns away from the Jedi Council specifically and doesn't follow a code. They follow the Force. And they don't have to use the dark side. Like, that definition doesn't necessarily mean a Jedi using the dark and the light. It just means following the Force, whatever that means to them. Well, I can think of, like, three Jedi right off the top of my head that come to mind whenever I hear that definition. Yeah, same. I do, th I do think it's a dangerous game to mingle in the dark, because if you're touching the dark, it has a way of grabbing hold of even the most well-intended Jedi. So I think the first yes. definition you gave... Um, kind of allows for a little more you got to be a lot real real cautious well and i think that's the definition that angers people and they're like you don't understand the force and that's not what george lucas meant like i think when people are talking about that part of it i get why people are upset but honestly also i don't get why people are upset because it's not real life but <laughs> <laughs> well there's that yeah i mean this is a fictional story that doesn't really exist but yeah so honestly, i guess honestly Talking about the Grey Jedi is talking about a much larger topic. It's can mm -hmm. you be black and white and or should you live in the gray? A and yeah. I'm talking like, can you be strictly committed to one side and one side only in your life or should there be balance? And take Jedi, take the word Jedi right out of it. Y yes, yeah. It's, yes. A, it's an examination. This whole episode is an examination on, uh, you know, can you dabble in the gray and still remain true to, you know, your own beliefs or whatever and still do good with it if you touch a little dark. I think the answer is yes. I think so too because the, while researching this, I came across the Dark Jedi, which I would love to do an episode oh. about also. Oh, that's the other side of things. <laughs> right, because Ventress is a really good example yes. of a Dark Jedi. That she was Sith, she studied the dark side, and then she kind of went her own way and used her power, but didn't necessarily use it for bad after she left the Sith. So right. there's a whole nother area. <laughs> She's kind of like a Jedi who left the council. She's a Sith that left the Sith and then like didn't quite make it into all the way into the gray. She's yeah. living in the dark gray zone. <laughs> and we love her for it, but <laughs> the murky area. <laughs> We yeah. love Ventress here, so... Oh, yeah. I don't know. I, I think I would consider myself a Grey Jedi all the way because there's no f***ing way I would... I would... <laughs> how do I phrase it? There's no <laughs> way I would remain strict to the code. I'm thinking Qui-Gon Jinn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. I'm thinking Ahsoka. I'm thinking Rey. There was no code at this time for Rey. And yes. she used Force Lightning, but for a good reason. She tried to save... Chewy on the ship and stop the ship from leaving and that force yeah. lightning is a no-no isn't it like yeah it's right up there with the force ch choke or whatever the um yeah. force crush you know the crush yeah I so I I thought it was very interesting I read about this I, the most of the stuff is legends right for the most part because gray jedi are not canon right correct Every reference, for the most part, even when they use the term, I believe, if there is the term used, Grey Jedi, it's always in a Legends scenario. But there was this guy, Kyle Katarn. Have you heard mm -hmm. of this character? Mm -hmm. I have, I think, yes. I think he's from a video game, I think. Knights of the Old Republic. Is it? Okay. So I think so. He, he was like a stormtrooper, right, who then joined the Rebellion and realized he was Force-sensitive. Oh my god, who does that sound like? <laughs> Finn? <laughs> yeah, right? Seriously, actually. <laughs> that's a good point. I wonder if Finn is based on him. Um, 
I mean, the guy's name is Kyle, so... <laughs> He's he's another one up there with uh, <laughs> one of the names that we named off like some really pedestrian male names. Like, <laughs> what was it like, Bob Skywalker? Or something yeah, Bob like that. Skywalker and Evan and Joe and Peter <laughs> and now Kyle is in on the mix. <laughs> Master Kyle, um, <laughs> but he he kind of expressed this idea that. The force isn't affiliated. It's neither light nor dark necessarily. Like it has a tendency when it's in balance to be on the light side and darkness comes in and tips the balance. But there's mm. this idea, I think they call it the potentium theory. And it's mm. actually mentioned in a legends book that the the allegiance of the force is determined by the user, not the force itself. Absolutely. So there there's there is no darkness there's dark people who use the force in dark ways and i guess they retcon this to be like a sith ideology or something like that but i think it's actually i think that makes a lot of sense personally well it's it's <laughs> it's like a weapon that can be used for good or bad you know and yeah only when it's used for bad is it destructive. But if you use it for good, you know, in defense mode, like so many Jedi did, then, you know, if you're battling an opponent and you're on the defense, you're still fighting them. But mm -hmm. I don't even know if that's a good example. Maybe I'll cut this. But, but power. Power has the ability power. to be used for good or corrupt the person that exactly. has it. Yes, so. yes, yes, yes. That's kind yeah. of what I was getting at. Yeah. But how do you know if it's good? If you don't know bad, right? Right. So, I mean, that's this is where it gets into the like larger philosophical question of what is good, what is bad, and that's determined like by a sense of social norms, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could say that goodness is and evil are maybe inherent because they quote existed at the beginning of the universe, or did they? Like the if you believe in things like the Big Bang, was there such a thing as evil and good at that time you know like i know this is getting way far off into like la la land here but that's ultimately where you come down to how do you know what's good and what's bad well this is the question that we have asked on this show to ourselves and to others is it brings up the question of were the jedi were the jedi knights peacekeepers during the war they were still following the code. They were following the council, mm -hmm. but they were actually doing harm in some ways. They were fighting. They were killing. They like there were actual casualties in what they were doing. It, this happens in the Avengers because <laughs> not to cross fandoms, but <laughs> a lot of people argue that the Avengers did a lot more bad than they did good. And I'm thinking of the Winter Soldier movie where they went into whatever town or city that was. And like, they literally blew up the place to save something. And in doing right. so, <laughs> they killed right. a bunch of people. I think about that every time I watch a superhero movie and something crashes yes. into a building. I'm like, how many people were in that building Those just Those people now? didn't ask for this because you, you're in some kind of game with trying to fight evil. And, you know, it's the yeah. same thing in Star Wars. There's so many casualties, but it's one of those things where it's like the... Um, it's like the necessary evil of mm -hmm. you have to go in, you have to do this job, and others might suffer because of it for the greater good. Now, you could think of that on a galactic scale. Essentially, that's what the rebels were doing. But as we saw in Andor, there's a lot of scummy, bad decisions that are being mm -hmm. made on behalf of the greater good. Right. Which it's like, what is good? What is bad? And to what end? I like that Star Wars doesn't shy away from that as well. You, it's even in Clone Wars to an extent, and then you see it in Andor, because at the beginning of, well, not the beginning, but like as Andor is a child, like when Cassie, Ka Cassa is a child, mm -hmm. that's a Republic ship that goes down. Yeah, yeah. And it's not, the, all of that mining and the way his planet was ruined was Republic. Yes. Because he was kind of like a separatist. They even kind of imply that at certain points. So, like, as a child, until the Empire came, you know, people were kind of, like, in the outlying, but they were still affected. And they talk about it in Clone Wars with the Mandalore thing with Satine trying to argue, like, mm -hmm. the f Senate votes to invade her planet without her getting a say. Right. You know? Like, what the f 
fuck is that? And then the Lurbin are another good example. Excellent example. The Jedi are there and they're protecting, but also, like, maybe the Separatists are there because the Jedi are there. You know, it's like this... It's... Yeah. It's difficult. (laughs) Yeah. It's... It's complicated. It's a gray area. (laughs) It is. (laughs) So what else did you research? Um, well, there was an actual, oh, well, again, this is legends. There was a faction of actual, like, gray Jedi. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pronounce this correctly. The Gen Serai. I don't know if you've heard of them. So this was, this is very messy and complicated. Whoever came up with this idea, I feel like they, like, got themselves into a spider's web and didn't know how to get out of it but the idea is that it was during um the clone wars there was a jedi who found a holocron that was a forbidden holocron Mm -hmm. in the jedi archives Mm. and he listened to it read from it learned from it and inside was a message that the jedi and the sith had once been the same and they learned from the same foundation and then the jedi took everything they could from the Sith and then outcasted them and treated them like Hmm. the evil ones. And the Jedi are then founded on an evil foundation. And so this guy goes off and starts his own faction called the Gen Sarai, and they are supposed to be gray Jedi where they use darkness and light. But it turns out that that whole holocron was planted by a Sith. Of course. To make the Jedi <laughs> fracture from within. So, like, it, it didn't end up going anywhere, and this is all legends anyway, but they particularly, like, hated Obi-Wan Kenobi because he was wow, the wow. ideal Jedi. and Of all course. <laughs> it, it, all this stuff, so, yeah. They hate him because they ain't him. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I could see that. Yeah. I would <laughs> hate perfection, good. too, if I... <laughs> If I wasn't perfect, which I'm not, but I'm saying, like, if I was a Sith, I would hate the antithesis of me, which is yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi. God Obi-Wan Kenobi, for sure. <laughs> so he that has was... perfect hair. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, it's true. He's, like, perfect in every way, and it's ridiculous. He really is. It's just <laughs> stupid. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, but then I also came across Bendu. Yes. Okay. Yes. I saw this, too. I, yeah. I, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, nothing. I mean, just like he is the perfect example of that middle ground. Yes. Which is now canon. Yes. Sorry, everybody, but. Yeah. It's true. I, I, okay, I love the Bendu. And I love that Kanan, who is actually an incredibly good Jedi, um, had an interaction with the Bendu. Mm-hmm. And at first he scared me. At first, and then he didn't, but then he did. And I can mm-hmm. totally see why. He's somewhere in that gray where if you treat it right, you can get good from it. If you treat it wrong, you can get... It's like, yes. take take the information, but take it with very extreme caution, you know? It's like the father in Mortis. Exactly. So here's here's where all of this comes together because... Because Kanan was good, he could gather from it. Did Ahsoka, Ahsoka was with the Bendu at one time, right? Or is there art from... There's art of her that Dave Filoni drew that I'm looking at right now. It makes total sense because in yeah. my opinion, Ahsoka is very gray. She lives in the gray. She's mm-hmm. been ousted by the Jedi Code, or I'm sorry, the Jedi Council. And then she chose to not return. So mm-hmm. and it's just like Qui-Gon Jinn. And in, in my opinion, Qui-Gon's end came too untimely, but... He would have been an extremely successful Jedi, just like Ahsoka is an extremely successful Jedi. Mm-hmm. And you kind of have to live through the darkness. And, and the fact that Ahsoka was there at Mortis and went through this rebirth of, you know, all, you know, as we know from the Mortis arc. Yes, she quite literally turned dark and then was brought back to life by having the spirit of good put inside her. Like, yeah, if anyone's balanced, she is. Holy shit physically and mentally mm-hmm. it's just but she chooses you could think of all the shit that happened to ahsoka she could have so easily turned dark just like obi-wan all of the mm-hmm. hurt and the loss and the betrayal but no these individuals remained good and they 
they kept that fine balance, you know, in intact. Obi Wan, yeah. for instance, just stayed true to the code to the very end, and and that's that. Ahsoka yeah. did not, and became was still an extremely successful Jedi. So <sighs> there's a lot of black and white, and very much gray. <laughs> Yeah, well, and the thing that kind of gets me with Ahsoka and Qui-Gon is they don't really have attachment. No, they don't. They have, they care about people. Obviously, Ahsoka and Rex have a very deep past, but there's this aloofness to her in Rebels where, and even in Mandalorian, you know, it's like she's warm, but she doesn't let people in too close. Mm -mm. And Qui-Gon was kind of the same. He was warm, he was. but yeah. he never, like, he did not, his his judgment wasn't clouded by attachment. And, and it might have been clouded by other things, like an obsession with the, uh, what's the word I'm looking, the prophecies. Yes, but yes. That's different. And, and I love Ahsoka and Qui-Gon in particular because they would not be told what to do Mm -hmm. If and they would not go along with something if they felt it was wrong, yeah. So why does yeah. that make them any less of a Jedi? It's really, it's really. I mean, in the eyes of the Council, I should say. Sure. Because wasn't Qui Gon kind of frowned upon? Yeah, you know, he was. Even Obi, even even Obi Wan even says like, "Oh, you shouldn't do that. You should just go along with the co the the Council." And mm -hmm. and Qui Gon's just like, "Oh, you have so much to learn, young Padawan," or <laughs> some form of that phrase, you know. And it's like that's maturity and seeing a lot more of the Council than say somebody younger has, and knowing, yeah, that the limit of it. Yeah, a anybody following something blindly without question, you run the risk of being really pulled far into something and something you might not even agree with and you might get neck deep in it before you turn around and be like wait what how how did i get here what, what mm -hmm. am i doing and i think mm -hmm. anakin started to have that too uh you see it 100%. definitely in the last couple seasons of clone wars and then revenge of the sith where he was unfortunately primed by palpatine the whole time so that when that doubt came in he turned to the dark side, whereas Ahsoka, when she had that doubt, turned mm -hmm. to herself and the Force. Yes. Oh, it's, there is only the Force. Yes. Right? Which is why Qui-Gon is so amazing of a character to me. I know some people really hate Qui-Gon, but... What? I, Who? Show them to I've, me. <laughs> I've heard... I have a whole bunch of messages in my Tumblr of people talking Qui-Gon they, oh. they don't like it because he abandons Obi-Wan and they feel hurt I, I get by it. that. But... I get it. And guess guess what? They're still Star Wars fans. Yes, exactly. I want to repeat this throughout this episode. <laughs> <laughs> you can think what you want in Star Wars and still be a Star Wars fan. This is true. Yes. <laughs> so I had the thought while doing this research that the whole reason that Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and Yoda and Luke mm -hmm. can preserve their consciousness after death is because of Qui-Gon. 100%. The fact that he didn't listen to the Jedi Council, that he went and studied other forms of the Force, that he found things fascinating and would pursue them because the Force touched his heart to do that. They must, the Force, they, the midichlorians, whatever, yes. the wills, the must have found him worthy enough to reveal this insane secret that no other Jedi in millennia had. Mm -hmm. So he's the middle ground. He's the gray area and so worthy of the wills that they reveal this crazy, this crazy thing that no Jedi has ever believed before. They did not believe True. you survived after death in any way. Yeah. They believed you joined the force. That was what they believed. Well, you you brought up, and I find this very interesting. You brought up the fact that Ahsoka and Qui-Gon did not have, they, they stayed completely detached from any kind of attachment. And isn't that what the Jedi Code and the Council wanted of a Jedi? Mm -hmm. You can't say the same about a lot of other Jedi, but these two quite literally remained detached forever, not in, an, in a cold way, but in a 
a warm, friendly, like mm-hmm. you, you described. And they're still considered somewhere in the gray. Mm-hmm. So does the council or would the council, if they still existed, <laughs> have a problem with them still? Or would they applaud them for their lack of attachment? Even though I'm, they're being, they're questioning the council and the code itself, right? They would probably applaud that lack of attachment. But I do feel like, especially nearing the end of the council's existence, they started to be much more, it seems like they only wanted people to follow what they said. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't give any, like how many times did they send Obi-Wan on these insane missions they were actually really damaging in the long term to Anakin and Obi-Wan and Ahsoka, ultimately. I was going to say definitely damaging to Anakin. Which yes. I, I'm pretty sure Palpatine knew it was going to be damaging to Anakin and thus sent, made sure to send him as yes. part of his grand plan. Exactly. But in the meantime, he developed Ahsoka as a side that he didn't even know. As, as like a... Mm-hmm. As like a... I'm having trouble with words today. I'm so sorry. Me too. <laughs> She's like the uh, unexpected consequence of trying to manipulate and brainwash Anakin. In turn, Palpatine ended up creating one of the greatest Jedi that ever lived, technically. I mean, if you want to go that route. She lived yes. in the balance. She's She made it to the end, so to speak. She was like the best of what Anakin had to offer. Precisely. Yeah. So there's the balance. There's the balance. The, the yes. son and the daughter. You could compare. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's coming full circle now. <laughs> That's why I love the Mortis arc, because it shows there is an extreme on either side, and then there's the father in the middle, and he mm-hmm. has great power and a great burden that he carries, mm-hmm. being in charge of controlling these two powers. But even he succumbed. He said, I made a grave mistake. I was a fool Mm -hmm. to not see what was happening with his son and his daughter and the greater plan and blah, blah, blah. Like all this stuff, right? So it does, there is some, somewhere in there, you miss stuff. Just like the father missed stuff. Yes, for sure. There's no, like, protection. There's no perfection in any of these forms. But if you're trying to find the closest alignment with the Force, then I feel like the Grey Jedi is the way to go. Where you're not, and I don't mean like having a little dark power. Yeah, right. <laughs> but no. if you think about it, Bendu was f-ing scary. He was. He, <laughs> he was. He created that storm. It was terrifying. Mm-hmm. But he was balanced. He's right in the middle, right? He's not aligned with light or dark. Mm-hmm. You just don't want to him off <laughs> well that reminds me the bendu was an original george lucas thing we talked about it in the wills episode that we did yes so yeah. down the line this is still kind of canon right i mean a little yeah. bit not by definition but in the sense that there are gray entities like the bendu yeah and i think that all the shows you know with feloni and De- uh, john favreau they're kind of trying to take... Remember how when we talked about the Wills? I think it was mm-hmm. in the Wills episode where we talked about George Lucas's plan for his sequel yes. trilogy. Yes. The shows are kind of taking those ideas mm-hmm. and slowly integrating them. So I think the Bendu was one of the first places that... Because it was the Jedi Bendu, right? That was like one of the first That's deep, correct. deep cut references from George yes. Lucas back in the day. So... I think he, that character is so beautifully performed too by, um, God, what's his name? Tom Baker, who was one of the doctors from Doctor Who. His voice Ah, is so perfect for it. His voice is fantastic and he does it, he has that edge to it where it's kind of, okay, it kind of reminds me of the Wizard of Oz when he's hiding. Yes, yes, (laughs) exactly. Are you following me? And then, like, when yes. you meet him, it's just diminutive. It's just a voice <laughs> changer. But, like, he has that kind of scary, will he help me, will he not help me, like, what do I yeah. do kind of voice. It's really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really good. Yeah, it's kind of, it. it's the kind of voice that makes me feel like glass, where it's not deep and warm. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Like it can be. He can have that deep resonance, but it's also like harsh and like reflective yes. and brittle and, yes. and it can pitch up where you're just like, oh, he's mad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really, I really love the Bandu because he's mysterious and just, I don't know. I like the mystery of it. I do too. And it's like, is he an animal? Is he earth? Is he a plant? Right, right. <laughs> like, no, he's, he's everything. all these things, yes. Yeah. And I think that's what I love about some of the animals, like the loth wolves are a good example mm-hmm. because they're like, mm-hmm. they are just the force. Yeah. I know. They, oh. You know, they, they could be scary. They're big animals. They're predators. And so, yeah, that could be scary. But it's kind of more that nature, you know, like sometimes nature is brutal, but it's yeah. the way, it's the balance. It's the cycle. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to be. And so I think that... The, the Bendu and the Loth Wolves are great examples of just, like, the living force. Mm-hmm. But they weren't scary for Ezra. Ezra was able to befriend them and call upon them, and they came because mm-hmm. they trusted Ezra, and they knew his force signature was good. And, and it's, yeah. like, it's like that thing where <laughs> I keep saying it. <laughs> the gray can be good and the gray can be bad depending on the user, which is something you said. And I, I right. fully believe that. I fully believe in that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and those, um, I don't remember what they're called, but in Rebels, there's the like spider animals, whatever. Remember by the Bendu. Oh, I, I f-ing hate those. I don't want to talk about those. No, I don't like I them. don't either, no. but <laughs> they, they like, I can't watch any of, any of those episodes, but they're also force centered you know and it's like to us it's horrific i don't want anything to do with that but again it's an example of like just because it's gross to us doesn't mean it's in its pure form i know i feel really bad saying that because i feel bad for hating snakes and spiders and stuff like in real life but i know that they're creatures that deserve to be here and that they serve a purpose and just because they can make give me the willies that doesn't right. make them bad <laughs> right i'm the same i'm i i have like a phobia for real where i actually feel like i'm gonna be ill when i think about this stuff but yeah but it's supposed to be here just like yes you know those creatures that are potentially horrific <laughs> in oh. star wars like they deserve purity as well so it's it's kind of it's an interesting thought because our instinct is to be revolted yeah, right? well, I mean, think of the Wampa. We we saw one holding the elevator door for people at Celebration. Who knew that Wampas were so kind? <laughs> I'm still not over that. A Wampa holding the elevator door. Come on in. Oh, <laughs> They're so polite. <laughs> Luke had it all wrong. The, the stormtroopers that we saw on the train also. It's just like, hmm, yeah. world's <laughs> colliding. <laughs> Sorry, it's just a wampa in an elevator is too much for me. But <laughs> I I really like the gray concept. It doesn't yeah. need to be canon for me to enjoy it, like many things in Legends. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't feel like I need a specific definition. Like we were, I think we said this with Michelle in our hundredth episode. Just because it's not an official doesn't mean that's not what the characters are. Yeah. Like, Sorry, but there are characters who are right down the middle, who aren't Jedi and who aren't Sith. What are you going to call them? Gray Jedi? Call them whatever you want. That's yeah. what they are, is right down the middle. Yes. So, I don't understand the controversy. Really? I like, don't either, but I don't, understand, I don't understand a lot of Star Wars controversy. I'm just here for the fun. And it's fun yeah. to think about this kind of stuff. I mean... yeah. There's just so much available to consider in this world of Star Wars. And I don't think uh, we should limit ourselves to some things because it's a whole big wide world out there in that galaxy, you know? Well, and you, how many times have we thought we had an idea, right? And then something new comes out and we're wrong. So I'm cool with that though. (laughs) I mean, that was really cool in The Last Jedi. And not that that's my favorite, but when Luke said it's time for the Jedi to end, I wasn't like, what? How dare he? It was like, okay, explain to me. Tell me more. Yeah. And he even said the Jedi had hubris and it was part of their downfall. And so some and people he even right. argue <laughs> that he's a great Jedi as a result of it. Well, I was going to ask you, do you think Luke falls into this category? 
I mean, if we were to, he's so good, but he's emotional. You know, he, he will go out of his way to not listen to save his friend. It's still there. The good is still there because he's doing good. But Mm -hmm. like, you know, recklessly leaving his training, like Yoda, Yoda was like, oh, he's a Skywalker. He's reckless. There he goes. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? But, but he doesn't do that after he learns from that. He doesn't really associate with anything. He's just. He's going to build a new Jedi Council, we know that, Mm -hmm. and teach him from a different point of view, one that strays from the original Jedi uh, theme, Jedi thought process, Jedi form, to make them a little more balanced. And hey, now that we know that we're getting another movie with Daisy Ridley and her dabbling in this, perhaps we'll get more on the gray concept. (laughs) Maybe she's going to start a school of gray Jedi and the Twitter verse will explode. <laughs> Probably. I mean, I just yeah. hope Finn is with her because Finn deserves yeah. so much more for his character. And since we literally just described him in talking about this. Seriously. He would be an excellent example. Excellent. You know, you I got agree. to have the dark in order to have the light. You can't, if everything was perfect. What fun would that be? Okay, don't challenge me on that. But you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Like, the level of appreciation goes way up for a sunrise when there's a sunset. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I think that talking about Luke is a good example of that. And even James brought this up in the interview because Obi-Wan has that moment where he says, Mm -hmm. you know, he says, like, only the weak embrace the dark side. And he is kind of – and he even said – that he feels like Obi-Wan has a lot going on underneath that he never lets out. Mm-hmm. And it's, to me, I've always taken that line as Obi-Wan knows he has darkness. Because we all do. We, we all, all do. have. We have a temper. We have frustration. Mm-hmm. And it's how we choose to participate in that emotion that makes us yes. who we are. And so he acknowledges, I think, that he has darkness, but chooses to not give that agency in his life. You know, And so I think... Luke is similar. Luke has a temper. We've seen it from the beginning. He has mm-hmm. the ability to rush in without thinking. Now, mm-hmm. Maybe that's not an ability. <laughs> that's just the... him being a Skywalker. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's just who he is. But I think he also isn't held back by the attachment he has for his sister and his best friend and eventually mm-hmm. his nephew, which mm-hmm. then he is. That all goes no, off no, no, no. in a no, weird no, no. F- thing but yeah what so in return of the jedi you see the rage that enters luke's eyes and he does dip his toe into the dark side before being like oh wait a minute what Mm -hmm. have i done Mm -hmm. not gonna do this and he immediately stops so yeah i think that he i think he could be considered a great jedi i i'm not sure i think of him that way because i think of him as such a pure jedi but kind of, if you look at him compared to Jedi from the Republic, he's nothing like yeah. them. Yeah, exactly. That that would be my point, is that if you compare them, I don't look at him as a gray Jedi either. I look at Ahsoka and Qui-Gon and um, Rey. I look mm-hmm. at them as gray, more gray, grayer <laughs> than Luke. <laughs> but Luke has dipped his toe in, like you said, but he made that choice, you know? Mm-hmm. And then in the, in the end, he understood through his studies how wrong and how far the Jedi strayed from balance, from the balancing mm-hmm. point, and how bad that it was for them. So he had this knowledge, kind of like hindsight's twenty twenty, right? He saw everything that already happened and realized this is wrong. We can yeah. make this better by dot, 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 whatever he right. ended up wanting to do. So that it was him experiencing the dark seeing and seeing what worked and what didn't. And I... I don't think I see him ever using the dark to, you know, to do anything. I mean, he chokes those Gamorians. Well, that's the truth. Get it, <laughs> Luke. But, I mean. <laughs> I mean, that's why I feel like Jabba's palace is a good example. He goes in there, ready to fight if necessary. He chokes people out coming through the door, starts a fight right away. And oh yeah, that's not what the Jedi would do during the Republic no. era. So. No. Anakin might have done that, but <laughs> Anakin would have done it and then redone it if he didn't like how he did it the first time. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Anakin. I wasn't harsh enough. Let me go back out and re-enter. Hang on. 
<laughs> yeah. I love him. <laughs> I do too. So yeah, I think personally for me, if I want, like, I if I'm going to be a Jedi, I want to be like Luke. I want to be that kind of Jedi because I think he realized the code is a good foundation, but it can't be lived by. And from what I read too, the Jedi didn't used to have the no attachment code that was added into the code later because... Well, I mean, Qui-Gon did have attachment with the, what's her name, right? Tall. Yes, but that's a different... Well... That's legends, but there is a reference to a canon relationship he had that they they Dooku, I think, or maybe it's not Dooku, it's the other guy, Rail Avaros, in the uh, Master and Apprentice book. He teases Qui Gon and is like, "What happened? Like, don't give, <laughs> don't you remember how you went and fell in love with a Wookie or something? I don't know, a Wookie." Yeah, I think it was a Wookiee. I'm not sure. I looked up the person's name and I was like, did Qui-Gon fall in love with a Wookiee? <laughs> I'm sorry. Right now I'm thinking of that Instagram <laughs> account of like, <laughs> sorry if no one knows what I'm talking about, look it up. But it's like a female Bigfoot who walks around with a bow in her hair and she dances <laughs> to songs on Instagram. That's the that's the Wookiee I'm thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> I love this idea so much. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let me, I'm going to look this up. If you know, you know. If you don't, then I just gave you a mental image that you'll probably never be able to get rid of. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, I love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I would be a great Jedi. I would be more like Ahsoka. I'd, there's no way I could ever live with a code. I'm sorry, Um, the council. I can't. I can't no. with the council. So I if I were to be like anyone, I would want to be like Ahsoka, number one, because she has two blades. And number two, <laughs> she doesn't follow the council. And I like that about her. But she's still out there doing good and helping where she can at all times. And I yes. think that's, in essence, the best form of a great je- Jedi, if we're considering her as one. I think so. I think that the old ways of the Jedi, you know, the Republic ways, they, they were inactive on certain things. They were passive about certain things. And I think Ahsoka is a great example about uh, of how being proactive can be a very positive thing that the mm-hmm. Jedi could have used, you know. For sure. And we're all still Star Wars fans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are so this week our question for our listeners do you believe in the great jedi are you a fan of it do you like it or are you really opposed to it and if so tell us why we would love to hear your thoughts on this next week's episode is a dedication episode essentially to the character of princess leia and the incredible woman who played her, Carrie Fisher, because Carrie Fisher just got her star on the Hollywood, what, what is the Hollywood Boulevard, whatever, Boulevard of Stars, whatever that's called. The, the Walk of Fame. The Walk of Fame, as she should. Her daughter was there. Uh, Mark yeah. Hamill was there. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about her as a human and how Princess or- Leia Organa has really impacted us, especially now that we've seen her in child form in Kenobi. So, It's an all Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher episode coming up next week. Last week, as you know, we had an interview with James Arnold Taylor, but though, well, not last week, two weeks ago, because I guess we took a week off. And then the week before that, we talked about our favorite Kenobi moment from the Clone Wars that made us both fanatics, Obi-Wan fanatics. So we asked our listeners... What was your Kenobi-defining moment from the Clone Wars series? And we got a few responses here on Spotify. Isla said, for me, it was definitely the episode The Lawless. The line he says to Maul about how he can kill him, but never destroy him. And like how he just is so destroyed when Satine dies, but controls it. Yes, couldn't agree more. So good. It's such a devastating moment, but it is a Kenobi-defining moment. It really is. It really is. I mean, above and beyond all, that moment right there defines his character. Yeah. It's amazing. I could never do it. (laughs) Me either. I would just crumple like a dry piece of paper if that was me. 
yeah, you'd have to come back to me after a week or so and ask me how I felt. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Goldie said, when he negotiated on Christoph Christophus, I can never Christophs. pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, I f***ed that place. Yeah. How do you say it? I can never pronounce it. Christophsis? Christophsis. Thank yeah. you. Bless yes. you. <laughs> In the Clone Wars movie, that moment changed my life forever. Do you remember this, Leanne, when he's like dragging it out and he wants a cup of tea? And oh, he absolutely. And the tea really slowly. The cup of tea is so <laughs> like boss it's just the it's height so of like <laughs> casually stirring it sipping it like what's the rush and he's just you know oh my god and the guy's getting more and more angry watching him just <laughs> <laughs> the round it's so good i love it and then lightwise said when he pauses and wants to find out how the Geonosian mind worms work and asks Anakin <laughs> whether he thinks they will enter through the nose or the mouth, that man is endlessly curious. He is, though. He went into science mode in the middle of, like, the craziest location and the craziest of circumstances. And even Luminara's like, can we hurry it up? Like, I'm up here. <laughs> so know? good. That is one of my favorite episodes ever. I love ever. that episode. <laughs> These are great comments. Thank you all. Yes, thanks to everybody who wrote in. So for the question we just asked previously, you can answer directly on Spotify. You don't even have to find us on social media if you don't want to, but you can, and you can email us these the feedback. Any Find us anywhere. Send us messages. It's It works great. And thank you so much for joining us here on the Most Things Kenobi podcast. We appreciate every single one of our patrons, and we've gotten so many new ones since the yes. James Arnold Taylor interview. We thank you so much for your support. And really, if you want to see the video of us and James talking and doing the interview, it is available for our Jedi Master tier. So if that interests you, head over to support our Patreon at the Most Things Kenobi Patreon. Or, as always, you can follow us on Tumblr, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. If you enjoy our podcast, we always welcome you to rate us on Spotify and Apple. And if you need just one place to find all of these, head over to mostthingskenobi.com. So, until next time, my space twin, may the Force be with you. Always. <laughs>